And what you find is if you pay the taxes and reinvest lower amount of money, but with a lower volatility, then on average, you will actually expect to have a higher value in literally just one year, one single year. Now, just, just one year, just one on average, just because there's so much more variation or volatility or wiggle factor in your current concentrated portfolio. Welcome to Retire Smarter with Kevin Krosky. Find answers to your toughest questions and get educated about the financial world. It's time to retire smarter. Well, hey there. Welcome to another episode of Retire Smarter. Walter Storholt here alongside Kevin Krosky, President and Wealth Advisor at True Wealth Design, serving you all throughout Northeast Ohio, Southwest Florida, and the greater Pittsburgh area as well. You can find the team online at truewealthdesign.com, where you can schedule a 15-minute call with an experienced financial advisor with the True Wealth team. Just click on the Are We Right For You button in order to do that. Kevin, great to be with you this week. How are you, my friend? Walter, it is always my pleasure. I'm good. And uh, I was curious. I believe uh, you were on vacation out to uh, Colorado, if I recall correctly. That's right. That's right. Um, made it back. Didn't get, uh, you know, didn't fall off any mountain ledges or anything like that. Was was able to safely complete a couple of hikes. And it was our first time ever being out, really in that region of the country. Um, I guess I've done Nevada, California, Oregon, and um, uh, Washington. But had, and I, I, far west I'd gotten, other than the far west coast, had been Iowa. So I'd never really done that corridor kind of in the middle. Well, I guess the flyover states, is that what people kind of call <laughs> that area? <laughs> no disrespect to those states. No, not at all, because, I mean, Colorado was awesome. I mean, we had a great time. We kind of stayed mostly in the central part of the state. We did four really long, arduous hikes. Uh, the weather was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, trading the heat and humidity of the south for dry 70 degree weather every day was just absolutely amazing to do that in August. So I, I was a big fan. It was a great trip. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, were you in, in Denver as well? Uh, well, we flew into Denver, but we really didn't spend any time in Denver. Um, so we, we went straight to the middle of the state. We were staying in, in kind of like one of those uh, ski resort type areas in the mountains. So uh, of course there was no snow being that it was in the summer, but they were still open and uh, had lots of activities and things like that to do. Mostly a lot of hiking is what we did. We did a little whitewater rafting on our last day, which was definitely a highlight of the trip and, a, and just so much fun. Did a little bit of uh, horseback riding, which Connie really liked. So yeah, there was, uh, there was, a, there was a good amount of things to certainly do. And uh, we, we packed every day. And there were a few days where we'd get back to the hotel at like four o'clock in the afternoon. We were so wiped out from the hike. We, we, we would pass out and then wake up at nine o'clock and be like, Okay, well, now we're full of energy again because we just took a four-hour nap, but it's like <laughs> 9 p.m. And, you know, it was kind of a sleepy resort little town, so it was kind of like not much to go out and do. But, you know, we found things to do. It was a lot of fun. That's great. I'm yeah. glad you had a good trip. Yeah, it was a really good trip. So I'd highly recommend it. If you haven't been to Colorado, go check it out. Definitely a great outdoor place. Glad to hear that you are doing well also. And uh, we've got a great conversation on tap today. We're following up a little bit with episode 79, our previous episode about aligning your investments with your values. Yeah, you got it. Um, so, and I think I mentioned in that one, um, we were going to ferret out a little bit more about these, call it separately managed accounts or SMAs. So the aligning uh, your investments with your values. Basically, we kind of talked through some of the pros and cons and then how to do it. And uh, there was you know, two solutions, broadly speaking, one more of a package product, um, and then two more of a customized solution, which I was calling uh, separately managed account or SMA. Um, and these, are, these SMAs have a lot of other benefits as well. And we use them, or at least the thinking behind them, um, in several other cases, there's some tax benefits too, and um, I'm sure most people are aware that uh, there's likely going to be some tax changes this year, which some of these benefits be could become even more. So I thought we'd at least take a few minutes today and talk about it a little bit more. And um, it's probably something that I see a lot of people that, that come in and start working with us. And, and here's usually kind of the, the situation that we find. So usually there's some sort of, we'll call it like a legacy holding or a concentrated stock position. Maybe it's something that, you know, they worked for a public corporation and were granted stock awards over time or had stock options and basically built up a fair amount of wealth um, 
over concentrated wealth in a, a single stock. Or, you know, we have several clients where they did inherit some money. And if you go back, you know, not, not all that long ago, basically the estate tax exemption, if your state was was a little bit more than I think it was 650,000. Um, and this was literally just probably 12, 13 years ago, you started having a taxable state. So it, it was quite common that you would have this sort of trust planning where some securities would go into what they call a bypass trust. And um, you know, basically they could be there, yeah, but they don't get a second step up uh, in cost basis at death when the surviving spouse passes. So Candidly, it doesn't matter all that much, but basically they were inherited eventually by our clients. But some of these positions were inherited um, or last stepped up from a cost basis perspective in the, I have one client with um, early 90s, you know, the, the markets did quite well through the 90s and, and kind of the tech boom, you know, didn't do a whole lot here domestically through the 2000s, but, you know, have been on another tear, you know, over the last decade or so. And these things, if you look at it, I mean, we're talking like thousands of percent gains. So if we take a step back for a moment, if you think about just kind of a traditional IRA, if you pull money out of your IRA, say you pull $10,000 out, well, by and large, that whole $10,000 is going to be taxable as ordinary income on your tax return. If you're investing outside of an IRA in what I'll just call a taxable account, you know, these are the accounts where you get a 1099 uh, every January showing you know, any sort of income that you have to pick up on your on your tax return. Well, here, you know, you have your cost basis. So if, say if we put $1,000 into buying a stock or a mutual fund and say it grew to 10,000 over uh, many, many years. Well, our gain is $9,000, the 10,000 minus the 1,000 we put in, uh, assuming that there's not been any sort of distributions reinvested over time. And the tax rate's also a little bit different versus the IRA. So here we're paying capital gains tax rates, which are less than the ordinary income tax rates that IRAs are subject to. So that's kind of what I guess the setup and some things to keep in mind here. But when you have those inherited positions, literally, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking through my mind in some of the client situations that we've dealt with over the years, there could be several hundreds of thousands of dollars in a single holding that has virtually, I don't want to say zero cost basis, but for all intent and purposes, it's it's close to zero. So if I go back to that ten thousand dollars example, you know maybe it is you know only a five hundred dollar cost basis, and so it's it's virtually all gain. And so from a planning standpoint, and, and from a retirement planning investment planning standpoint, what do you do with those? You know, do you just hold them? Do you sell them? What do you think, Walter? I think you get a lot of uh, a lot of options. Obviously, I mean, it sounds like one of the benefits of the SMA is customization. Completely. Um, so every case is different. Um, you know, it's the, it depends is always pretty much the right answer for everything. But I'll just talk through some of these high levels. So even before we talk about the SMA, let's just let's just talk about you know completely selling out of it and then reinvesting. So one of the basic principles here is uh, what we'll call the wiggle factor. You know, we've talked about this in the past, Walter. Uh, when I say wiggle factor, do you remember what I'm talking about? <laughs> R- remind me the wiggle factor. <laughs> Standard deviation. So That's right. the, the volatility of an investment or investment portfolio. So individual stocks have more volatility or more of a wiggle factor. They move up and down a lot more than a basket of stocks that are diversified. Uh, and, and you see this all the time. So like an individual stock, for example, you know, may have on average, say, a 30% standard deviation or wiggle factor. Whereas if you look at the entire basket of stocks, say, in the S&P 500, it's closer to 20% or so. It varies a little bit over time. There's periods of time that are less volatile or more volatile. But if you take a good long swath of time, that's pretty common what you'll see. So it's maybe 30, maybe even 40% volatility for an individual stock. Um, and maybe 20% or so for, say, the S&P 500. If we're talking about a basket of smaller stocks, then the wiggle factor will be a little bit higher. There's just a little bit more volatility, a little bit more risk that's there. Uh, so, so that's one important variable that's going to come into this. So if we have perfect foresight over this individual stock, we have concentrated stock position that we've earned through our work at this, at this company or you know, that we inherited or what have you, The standard deviation of that stock, the wiggle factor of that stock matters. Uh, If we do have perfect foresight that we just know that, hey, that stock is going to do better than the market, then, you know, all this becomes moot. But 
Now about you, Walter, the crystal balls tend not to work that well. And so we come back to kind of playing probabilities or putting odds in our favor. Uh, and that's what exactly this is, this is about. And when you relate it to retirement planning too, it's one of those things where if you have an over-concentration of risk, then you could have some bad outcomes and have to make some undesirable changes to your lifestyle. Work longer, spend less, hopefully not unretire and go back to work. But you know, this is how these, these are all linked. So when you have more volatility, let's say that you know, we have these holdings and let's just say that we're going to get the same expected return. You know, we're talking about transitioning or do we hold it or do we sell it, pay the tax bite and then move on. You with me? I am with you so far. All right. So, so here, here's kind of the, the, uh, the example that I have. Let's say that the portfolio, the initial value is 1.5 million and our cost basis is 500,000. So we have a million dollar gain from our initial investment. Kudos to us. That's fantastic. So we will assume our tax rate is 25% in all these scenarios. So that's fairly consistent with what capital gains would be taxed at when you factor in federal and, and if you're in a state that's taxable like Ohio. Let's just say that we can expect 9% on these investments, purely hypothetical. And that's both true for our current holdings or what we'll call our legacy holdings. And it's also true for the portfolio that we're going to transition over to. The key difference is that wiggle factor. The individual stocks, maybe we just have a few of them. Maybe it's just a handful or so. But the volatility for that portfolio, for our legacy portfolio, is 30%, 30% wiggle factor. And going over into the new portfolio, our transition portfolio, it's just 20%. So more consistent with, say, S&P 500. So if you think about it, we stay, we keep invested, the whole $1.5 Let's say that we don't you know, need the money or anything like that, and we're just going to let it roll, and we're going to let it roll for 25 years. Or in the transition portfolio, we're going to go ahead and sell all of those legacy stocks. We're going to take the tax hit, and we're going to pay the taxes on that million-dollar gain at a 25% tax rate. So that means that we have $1.25 million to reinvest in this new, better diversified portfolio. That has the same exact expected return but less of a wiggle factor. Okay, let me check in again. Walter, are you with me now? Yes, so can you explain, so why would we then have less of the wiggle factor, in the, just because of the way it's going to be invested in that new portfolio? For the simple reason that, um, that you're gonna have more stocks in there for sure. I mean, the S&P 500 is a good example, but you know, it's, let's just say that you know, we, we went down to the shore, Walter, and we are selling umbrellas uh, on the beach you know, for the sun. Well, a good diversifier to that might be to sell umbrellas when it's raining because your umbrella sales for the sun at the beach are probably going to tank that day, but maybe people need some umbrellas for the rain. So it's a natural, those sales will not be correlated. They'll move in a dissimilar fashion. So you'll get a smoother path for your sales overall. Now, if you expand that to you know, having, say, 500 stocks in, say, the S&P 500, that becomes much more pronounced. And as a quick aside here, I mean, we went through this, <laughs> I think this may be where you kind of created and pulled out the egghead alert, but we went through two concepts uh, of standard deviation and terminal wealth dispersion previously. Those are definitely applying and answer the question that you just asked in a more detailed fashion. But just for now, hopefully what I explain does a fair enough job. I'm, um, I'm pretty sure terminal wealth dispersion was the birth of the egghead alert. Yeah, I think you're right about that. <laughs> right. I know people are just like, yes, I have to go back and listen to that one for sure. <laughs> um, but I, I think the thing that you have to keep in mind here is, you know, we're investing less money in this new portfolio because we took the tax hit. You know, we're expecting the same return but our wiggle factor is less. So now we can use that information, just those few variables that I mentioned, to go ahead and do some statistical modeling to figure out what is most likely to produce a larger value over time. And you know, again, if, if you know exactly that what stocks are going to do or the portfolio is going to do, you know, if you know that stocks say, hey, these stocks that I have, I mean, they're going to do better than 9%. I know they're going to do better than 9%. Well, hold on to them. I just, <laughs> I would say that you don't know that uh, and you should be a little bit more humble. And we've, we've talked about a whole slew of other reasons why you, you can't really know that um, forward looking. So you do want to diversify, you do want to manage risk. And, uh, but here we're just introducing this third variable of 
well, you know, we have to pay a tax hit to get out of this position, out of these legacy positions doesn't make sense. And if you go through and, and you do this simulation, again, 9% expect a return investing 1.5 million versus 1.25 million after you pay the taxes, but having the difference between a 30% wiggle factor or standard deviation and a more diversified 20%. If you look at what you can expect on average, and when I say that, if you just think of kind of that normal bell-shaped curve that we've all at least been exposed to over time and we've talked about on a few times through the episodes, you're just talking about the middle of that curve, the 50th percentile. And what you find is if you pay the taxes and reinvest lower amount of money, but with a lower volatility, then on average, you will actually expect to have a higher value in literally just one year, one single year. Now, Just, just one year. Just one on average, just because there's so much more variation or volatility or wiggle factor in your current concentrated portfolio. Now, there's certainly, and that, again, we're talking about on average, you know, there's a fairly wide dispersion or 30% wiggle factor um, is it, quite a bit. Um, the way to, I won't go through the math. You can go back and listen to the standard deviation episode if you'd like to, but, um, but on average is what we're talking about. So if you go out further in time than one year, and I have the numbers here for 25 years, but um, 25 years later, and this is looking at the amount of money that you have. So again, in that current portfolio, you have 1.5 million. In the new portfolio, the transition portfolio, you have 1.25 million that's been invested because you paid the taxes. So after 25 years, which one is going to produce, what's the wealth that's created you know, at that 9% expected return with the volatility that I mentioned? It's a little bit more than four million under your current portfolio, and it's about five point six million on average, fiftieth percentile, under the new, more diversified, more reliable portfolio. Just a small difference, just a very small. Yeah, I mean, difference, right? we're talking about twenty-five years, and, and this is uh, in this example, you you actually are paying taxes after twenty-five years, which candidly, you can argue, say, well, like in today's law. I mean, this may change. It's it's talked about being changed, but you know, if you have capital gains, if you invest that stock, you know, whether it's whatever stock it may be, Disney, Apple, you name it, it's usually some of these ones that have been around for a while and the you know kind of people you know, just identify with or what have you. But if you hold on to that all the way until death, the capital gains go away. They're stepped up at death. And so your beneficiaries inherit them free of any capital gains. And so that's current law. That very well could change. It's actually a proposal under the Biden tax plan that it will be changing. We'll see how what actually happens. But I have another example. I won't go through in painstaking detail like I just did on the last one. But that transition portfolio where you do pay the taxes still wins. It just doesn't win by as much as the example that I just gave. But part of the goal here is the predictability, the consistency of switching to this transition portfolio, this other portfolio, because it's it's all about the mission of those dollars. And you're talking about this being really with the intents and purposes of being a legacy. And that's what sort of helps change the dynamic and, and changes that understanding of what's the purpose of these dollars and of this portfolio. Well, I mean, you always want to know what the purpose of the money is, for sure. You don't want to put the cart before the horse. I would say that the example that I just gave is a little bit more on the investment side and on the mathematical side about how do we actually optimize and make a smart decision in an uncertain environment. You know, we don't know, you know, what stock or what strategy or what portfolio is going to do the best in the future. But if assuming that we can come up with some reasonable and another question you may be asking as well. How do we formulate these expected returns? And that's a whole other question. In my example, I just simplified it and uh, just you know just stated that they are the same. And, you know, we've we've talked about this at least kind of building expected returns for for baskets of stocks. But if you're doing it for individual stocks, um, you know, good luck. It's it's way way more uncertain. But that's the whole point that that I think you should be taking away from this. If you do have these kind of legacy holdings, one way or the other, or this concentrated holding. And sometimes, it, generally, it's, we find it, you know, somebody has a, a tax issue that we have to work around. You know, it may not be that we're going to transition out of it and just kind of sell it completely. You know, maybe we're going to build around it, which I'll talk about here in a moment. But, and that's really where the SMA comes in. 
But when we're looking at to do somebody's retirement plan and make sure that, you know, whatever their purpose for their money is, we want to make sure that that money is aligned to support that. And we want to make the most out of what they have. And so it's one of those things. Nobody likes paying taxes. And sometimes you can use a little Jedi mind trick here that helps, you know, in the example that I gave, you know, we said that, hey, you're paying a 25 percent tax, you know, on the gain. So on the million dollars. Well, you get to keep. 75% 75% of the gain. <laughs> it's another way to look at it. It's just the opposite side of the same coin. Or, you know, if you look at it overall, you know, it's it's 1.5 million that you have initially, but you get to go ahead and reinvest 1.25 million free of any tax. So, you know, these are these are different things, I guess, that, that we have to work with. But um, but we've had several, I mean, I can think of probably 10 clients where they have meaningful legacy positions that we've had to work around. Um, and some of them are easy. Some of it just, you know, hey, it's a third rate investment. It's high cost. It's tax inefficient. This thing just makes sense to sell. It's a little bit tougher, I think, when the gain gets larger and, you know, there is a pretty big tax hit. Um, but even if we back up, I mean, you know, the example that we just gave, you know, you have a $500,000 investment. It's tripled in value to $1.5 million, So you have a million dollar gain. Uh, so, you know, that's a pretty big increase right there. And the example that I gave still, you know, the probabilities are in your favor to actually do a full transition, take the tax hit and then reinvest in a better diversified portfolio. And hopefully you can actually take it so that not only are you expecting a similar return, but perhaps you can engineer it so you can expect a higher return. And that's that wasn't in the numbers that I shared. Um, but Rather than going for a full transition, let's just say that, you know, the separately managed account, let's say somebody has this kind of legacy holding and it's something that we need to work around, but they have enough money or at least a fair amount of money elsewhere that is liquid that we can kind of build around. So in a case like that, let's just say it's, you know, somebody has Disney stock and they inherited this back in the seventies or whatever, and it's basically all gains today. So they're looking at this and they say, well, you know, Disney, Hey, who doesn't like Mickey, right? Do I really want to sell Disney? Um, and we'll try to get that emotion out of it. But you look at it and, and same sort of thing. You know, do I want to sell this and take the hit? And, and it kind of depends too. You know, it, candidly, if they're if they're older in age and um, you know maybe don't have that many uh, investing years left, nobody has that certainty. But maybe you do want to hold on to it and try to get that step up. Or at least you're kind of leaning that direction. But you know, even if you have say a few hundred thousand dollars, say in Disney stock that you inherited, but you have maybe a couple million dollars elsewhere that you can build around it, well, maybe then we don't go for the full transition, but we start looking at it and saying, well, hey, if Disney is here, and then in this separately managed account environment, we we can do this. Say Disney's here; it has these characteristics. Maybe we have a few other legacy holdings that are kind of there as well. Basically, what we would then do is kind of use that information about the characteristics of those stocks and try to build out a better portfolio around them where we can go ahead and hopefully increase our expected return, where we can lower our wiggle factor or volatility, and we can avoid the tax hit. And that's really where, you know, if you're not going to completely sell and go into that transition portfolio in that prior example, that's really where the separately managed account or some version of it come into play. So it's not kind of just selling and kind of reinvesting day one. It's probably pruning maybe some of it, or if you do have enough assets that are liquid where you can invest around those legacy positions and they kind of, those legacy positions kind of become the foundation or the pillars of your investment plan. But then we just build around them to hopefully get some of those benefits of higher expected returns, better diversification and a lower wiggle factor. So these SMAs really just give you so much more flexibility with what to do with the plan. So versus just throwing money into mutual funds where you then lose a lot of that flexibility and and the ability to kind of, you know, shape and morph and make some of these tax decisions and movements, you maintain that when you have an SMA and have a little bit more brain power, I guess, going behind not just the investment decisions, but then how things are put in, taken out, shifted, transitioned, moved around. That's where a lot of the benefit of, of the SMAs lies. Completely. I mean, it's okay. it's pure customization. So, you know, there's we like to use mutual funds and ETFs. We use them a lot. I'm not saying that they're not good strategies or good products to use. You know, the SMA is really another tool in the tool belt. And, and just as a refresher, 
you know, we talked about it last time, um, but the SMA, rather than say like the S&P 500, rather than buying an S&P 500 ETF or index mutual fund, you would just go out and buy those 500 stocks directly and not in that mutual fund wrapper. So here, what we're saying is, well, maybe you have five of your legacy holdings are in the S&P 500. So rather than going out or buying that ETF or mutual fund, uh, you know, S&P 500 index, we're going to use the SMA and we're going to buy the other 496 stocks. And in fact, we may not just buy the other 496 stocks, but we may underweight certain industries that those legacy holdings are in. Certainly, we're not going to buy them and add more to it because we're already over concentrated, but we could go ahead and craft. Essentially, it's kind of like our own mutual fund, if you will, but we're just buying the individual stocks directly with the goal and with the intention to engineer it, to get those higher expected returns, to go ahead and manage the diversification, lower that wiggle factor, and do it in a very tax aware fashion. And when we talked about it last time uh, in the whole kind of ESG impact investing, kind of aligning your investments with your values, you can also express those sorts of beliefs and wishes through the SMA. I mean, if you wanted to go ahead and completely exclude you know, anything that would be related to um, a common one is environmentally conscious investments, you know, or, you know, anything that is kind of energy maybe is not really falling under that for, for some certain people. So you can just go ahead and add these exclusions, whether it's kind of a legacy holding, as I explained, or whether it's something that's a personal belief or value. You can do all of that through the SMA, but the big, you know, the core concept is, Really, you're just buying the stocks outright and not in that packaged product, but you're still doing it with the eye to go ahead and keep your costs low, maintain adequate diversification, lower that wiggle factor, and engineer your overall portfolio for you know, the optimal return that you can for how much risk that you want to take. You know, that's it in a nutshell. Um, there's all kinds of different applications of this, but you know, I hopefully the way that I explained it gives you an idea. You know, it's usually those positions where you know we call them legacy holdings. Somebody's owned something for a long time; it's grown. That's great. But now, what do you do with it? And you know, maybe you go ahead and transition it all right away. Sometimes we do that because you know it makes sense. You know, it's a third-rate investment today. It's high cost. It's tax inefficient, so on and so forth. But other times, when you have something. Um, you know, we have a, a new client that has a lot of Berkshire Hathaway stock. It's actually the most concentrated one out of our entire client base. It's quite a large sum of money. You know, Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, uh, it's, a good, it's a good investment. It um, has been for quite some time. Um, but there's, we're kind of using that as the foundation of the investment plan, and then we're diversifying around it because there's plenty of other liquidity that the client has. We've had several of these cases recently. I guess it's one of the reasons why it's top of mind, but you know, hopefully I did a decent job kind of explaining the pros and cons to it. I'm not saying that everybody should go out and use a separately managed account, but when you do have those characteristics, whether it is you know, kind of like an ESG impact uh, investing, more values-based investing, or whether you have this legacy position where there's a high tax cost to get out of it, that's really where an SMA could be used smartly to go ahead and, and, and get the portfolio closer to where it needs to be and still you know, optimize whether it's a values-based investing decision or your own personal tax management. This has been uh, very helpful, actually. I really enjoyed the conversation, Kevin. I thought you were going to start trying to get me to do math when you were throwing out 1.5 million, 500K cost basis, million gain, 25% taxes, 9% expected investments, one year versus 25 year <laughs> returns. I was just waiting for that math question to come. Oh, I was, man. I was so prepped over here with the calculator. Like, red, we're just, just, you've got me on edge, man. You know how, you know how to get me, like, and psych me out. So uh, I, know. I, I was thinking about how do I tell this story without all these numbers? And Walter, I just couldn't figure out how Sometimes to do it. Sometimes so you need the numbers, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, but I, I, I tracked pretty well, actually, as you were laying, laying it all out. I was just ready for some curveball of like, now, if you took the factorial of the uh, square root of that result, Walter, what would that be? <laughs> I'm just disappointed you didn't remember what the statistical term for wiggle factor. Well, now you know why I was so stressed about the, <laughs> the number question that I wasn't ready for the, the simplicity of wiggle factor. I actually, in fact, if you had just said standard deviation, I probably could have given you a textbook definition right off the bat. But wiggle factor, my brain wasn't ready for that 180 of, uh, you know, technical term versus, uh, you know, just a little fun, fun little side term. So 
Uh, you got you got me spun up on this one. It was fantastic. Um, yeah, if you liked today's conversation, and maybe this is your first time tuning into Retire Smarter, well, good news. There's 80 other awesome episodes that you can go back and listen to, especially the previous one, kind of an extension of today's conversation, but in a different way. Uh, you might enjoy that one. Lots of other great topics that Kevin has dove into over the past couple of years as well. Go back, consume it all. It's good stuff. Um, hey, Walter, one, yeah. one other thing I want to let me interject briefly Please. before we wrap up. And this is an important point. I should have made it sooner. But you know, whenever you know, you're working with somebody, particularly a new client, if you go to a lot of places, um, basically they just they sell everything and you just start investing. It's very rigid. You know, what we talked about in really kind of analyzing you know, what we can expect both from a return standpoint, you know, from a diversification and volatility standpoint, and considering the tax benefits, uh, candidly, it's what we've always done from day one. We've done it. You know, we've certainly done it. I think I've learned a lot over time and have done, been able to do it better. But it, it just makes sense. Hopefully, you can see that. But you know, whenever if you're going into a financial advisor, they say, "Okay, we're just going to sell everything and you know reinvest." That could be the right answer. But if you have these, you know, these legacy positions, if you have a concentrated stock position, um, and you have tax implications to it, you really need to be a lot more thoughtful behind that. I mean, I, I made a pretty good case early on about hey, it could just make sense just to transition, but you know, that's, it depends, <laughs> is, is definitely the mantra there. And as with anything, you really need to kind of do the work before you come to the conclusion. So just kind of, uh, I don't want to say buyer beware, but, um, you know, if you're looking for an advisor and you have some of these legacy positions, if you have some of these low cost basis inherited positions or a lot of company stock that you've accumulated over the years, you really need somebody that's going to be able to think through that thoughtfully and in a mathematical way to go ahead and figure out what's the best thing to do to tie that back to your plan and your values and make sure you make the most out of what you have. I don't think uh, in the couple of years that I've uh, now known you, Kevin, that you've ever done anything that didn't have a lot of thought and reason behind it. Um, that goes for our episodes here on the show and the way that you do your planning and the way that you talk about it and describe it. So I love it. You you always want to make sure that there is a why behind everything that you decide and you do and you talk about. And I have to pick on you, and I, and I hope you don't mind. I'm going to share this with the audience. Uh, it's just especially appropriate given what you've just talked about, thoughtfulness and everything. Uh, this episode, believe it or not, folks, was the one that Kevin said maybe he's been least prepared for <laughs> in the entire uh, existence of Retire Smarter. I find that hard to believe based on how well prepared the numbers and the examples were. But there you have it. That just is a good example of how thoughtful and uh, much time and attention you put into the things that you and I know that your team embraces this too, Kevin, um, and, and, and just what you guys do. And so I think that's that's pretty cool because that's rare in today's world. Um, it's easy to just, hey, here's your situation, implement it. But you really want to make sure that all the due diligence is done in the background. And uh, I think that should be celebrated in today's world a little bit. So, Well, thank you, Walter. Good on you, my friend. And uh, thank you for the help on the show today. If you've got any questions as you listen to this program or any other episodes, want to find out a little bit more about what you know true customized planning looks like, want to find out if the True Wealth team is right for you, you can go to truewealthdesign.com. You're going to see a little orange button at the top of the page. Another one, if you scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, it's going to say, are we right for you? That's where you can click and schedule your 15-minute call with an experienced financial advisor on the True Wealth team. So it's pretty easy to do. It's truewealthdesign.com. And we'll link to it in the description of today's show as well. You can also give a call if you prefer, 855-TWD-PLAN. That's 855-893-7526. 80 episodes of Retire Smarter now in the books, Kevin. Congrats. I don't know if that's technically a milestone. We probably should have celebrated at 75 if we wanted a mini milestone, <laughs> but 80 is a nice round number at least. So there we go. Yeah, that's, it's great. It's um, My wife just asked me the other day, actually last night over dinner, she's like, how many people listen to this thing? And uh, I, I told her I think we've had more than 50,000 downloads. Um, and her eyes, she's like... <laughs> Like, who the hell would want to listen? I'm to married that to much? a celebrity. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I think she was. Uh, well, she yeah, she, she wasn't was so much impressed as she was su just surprised. <laughs> yeah, she was. She was surprised, and you know, and we've had a lot of people that have reached out. To, you know, candidly, I've been surprised. We st I started this with the idea that we were going to talk, going to be able to reach our clients and kind of keep them educated, and you know, maybe we would meet some new people. And um, it's been both of those and more. Um, so it's been. 
interesting. Uh, people listen, they, they, you know, they get to hear your personality. They feel like they get to know you. And, um, we've met some really nice people that have become great clients, you know, through it. And, um, I think it's a really good way to kick the tires too. You know, if you go into a place and yeah, it's just, it's tough. We've talked about this, you know, how difficult it is to hire any professional, including a, a financial advisor, but, you know, through a podcast like this, or, you know, you really get to know somebody and see what they know. And, you know, you gotta, you know, trustworthy and competent and people tend to do business with people that they like. So I think it's a good way to really kick the tires. And I appreciate your help in doing this, Walter. Absolutely. It's always, uh, always fun when we get together and Hey, we'll do it again in uh, two weeks. So everybody come back and join us for the next episode of retire smarter for Kevin Krosky. I'm Walter Storholt. Take care. We'll talk to you next time. Information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Information is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accurateness and completeness cannot be guaranteed. All performance reference is historical and not an indication of future results. Benchmark indices are hypothetical and do not include any investment fees.